Thank you so much for doing this. Um, the, the Democrats, we just heard them out there during this hearing. They have this line of attack that censorship of conservatives is a false narrative, uh, an imaginary narrative. Do you agree with that? And um, if you disagree with that, what do you make of this line of attack? At least looking backward, there is just too much evidence uh, that we have at hand showing that these social uh, platforms have in fact been discriminating against conservative views, conservative organizations, conservative news media of all kinds. And they've adjusted their algorithms. Sometimes they have blocked or actually deleted information that was conservative in nature. Uh, we have Google at one point uh, making it impossible or, or designating as a hate group uh, religious freedom organizations, uh, border security organizations, pro-life organizations. So clearly they were targeting conservative type of viewpoints. And that's the kind of thing that really worries us. Here are platforms, whether it be Facebook or Google or anyone else, that are supposed to be neutral, that are supposed to be objective, and clearly they have not been in the past. Uh, during our hearing, I asked each of our witnesses one question, and that is, would they publicly pledge uh, to do everything they can to neutralize bias in the future. All three said yes, and they were Facebook and Twitter and Google. So we're going to hold them to that public pledge. Uh, none of them denied the bias in the past, which was, I think, important to their own credibility. We have just too many examples of, of their bias in the past. So I think we're making progress. They know we're looking over their shoulder. Uh, and we also know that these groups are just uh, lean liberals, sometimes radically so, from the top to the bottom. The owners are liberal, the management is liberal, the um, staff is liberal, and sometimes, intentionally or otherwise, that uh, finds itself manifested in what they allow in the way of content. So we're going to be monitoring them. What can be done to monitor, to combat bias in media? Right. I think there's two primary ways to combat bias in the media. First is to educate the American people about the extent of the bias. I mean, uh, President Trump has received over 90 percent negative coverage since he's been president. That's an all-time high for any president. And the people who watch the news are aware of the bias, or at least they're aware of the criticism, the savagery directed towards the president, and the complete pervasive effort uh, by the media to try to defeat Republicans and elect Democrats. That's pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't realize that that's uh, that they're witnessing and uh, bias, and we want to make sure that we educate the American people and get them to sort of filter out the bias. So that's one thing we can do. Uh, the second thing we can do is to point out examples of media bias and just remind the media of their absolutely awesome responsibility in a democracy to give the American people the facts, not tell them what to think. So Facebook and YouTube, they've announced that they're going to be directly funding uh, news content from establishment outlets like Vox Media and CNN. We also have um, Facebook saying that they're going to reduce the visibility of so-called fake news by up to 80 percent. Does it worry you that just a handful of executives in Silicon Valley are choosing what news Americans get to see and what they don't get to see? It very much worries me and it ought to worry the American people that a few executives with liberal backgrounds are deciding uh, who defines what fake news is, who defines what hate, sp hate speech is, um, that is very, very worrisome. B only because we've seen in the past how they defined it for their own purposes. And if they define it uh, by defining conservative viewpoints out, uh, that's not fair to the American people who deserve to get the objective news, not just the slanted news. So uh, all we can do is watch carefully, educate the American people, and then point out examples of bias and try to get the media to frankly acknowledge their incredible responsibility in a democracy not to slant the news, but to give the American people the facts and then let them make up their own minds. Would you support reclassifying organizations like Facebook so that they would have to fall um, underneath those Section 230 rules? I think it is hard to reclassify a private company and you have to be very, very careful. I believe strongly in the First Amendment and the freedom of speech and they have a right to be biased if they want to, but we have a right to point out the bias and to try to hold them responsible for their bias. So I think that that kind of a delicate balance is probably the best way to go it. The pendulum swings back and forth, although it seems to have been stuck on 
liberal now for many decades. Uh, but I think we just simply need to hold them responsible. And frankly, in a democracy, if they continue to be biased and slanted, then another organization will start up that either will be objective and attract more uh, consumers and the American people, or might be conservative and attract people who uh, will go to them because their point of view is reflected. So I think within a democracy, we have built-in checks and balances, and we shouldn't threaten to necessarily take over a private company just because they air views that we don't agree with. We've heard members of the press presenting themselves as victims in the age of Trump. They've accused the president of encouraging violence against journalists. What do you make of this rhetoric? Um, it's all made up. It's, <laughs> they're the ones who are now guilty of spreading fake news. Uh, the president has only talked in terms of holding them accountable. And quite frankly, when the media intentionally prints or writes or distributes something that they know is false, that is fake news, and the president is right to call them out. Uh, they can put up all these, uh, uh, all these, you know, imagined uh, injuries and imagined, uh, uh, um, you know, criticism. Uh, but uh, the president has done exactly the right thing, and I think one of the reasons he's so popular in America is that he does confront media bias and he takes on political correctness. And I think the American people are tired of the bias and tired of the political correctness, even though the media seems to want to defend it to the very end. So you're also the chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And we've heard a lot about this Space Force. My first question is, how do I join? <laughs> um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, we are talking about the concerns that we have with just a handful of Silicon Valley executives making and deciding what happens on our social media platforms. Right. Will Elon Musk and the Jeff Bezos of the world Will they have a, a large say in what happens with our new U.S. Space Force? Well, the Space Force, as I understand it, is actually part of the U.S. Air Force. And it's a, an acknowledgement that were we ever have to conduct warfare, you might call it, in the space, uh, we need an entirely different approach. And we do. Uh, it may be satellite warfare, or it may be some other type of warfare, but it's different from what we've encountered in the past, and in the Air Force is it's now configured, is not necessarily ready for conflict in the heavens, in space. And so, uh, I don't know the details as to how that might work. No one has talked about those yet. That's why we have hearings. But uh, whether we call it a space force or whether we call it a new uh, component of the Air Force, uh, we need to be ready for attacks in space as well as uh, closer to the Earth in the air or on the land. Uh, it's been, uh, speaking of the military though, it's been really disappointing to me. I saw the other day where uh, Google employees uh, sort of basically threatened the management who immediately rolled over and the employees said, well, we don't want to do anything that will help the military in any way. We have some indirect contracts with the military where we get them some information and we want to stop that. And of course it took the management milliseconds, well actually a few hours to uh, roll over and uh, capitulate and say to their employees, okay, we won't have any more contracts with the military. Now that comes awfully close to being un-American, but for the management of Google to be rolled so easily by their employees and not stand up for principle and not say we need to help everybody and we can defend helping the military who after all defends us every day of the year uh, was again an example of bias that we don't need. I just want to loop back though on this, this concern that sort of just a handful of top executives, many of which have proclaimed their left-leaning tendencies, might have a lot of say in what happens with a program, and maybe not just this program, but any program that America might be rolling out. What will Congress be doing? What will we be looking at to ensure that this doesn't happen? Well, I think what you're going to see is exactly what the Judiciary Committee just did, and that was to have a hearing, and you invite, for example, Facebook and Twitter and Google uh, to um, hold them accountable in a public forum and uh, point out their biases and get them to swear that they aren't going to be uh, biased in the future. And we just have to keep pointing that out and then letting the American people know what we find out. After all, we're the American people's representatives. The American people want the facts. They want objective news uh, reporting. And to the extent they're not getting it, uh, then uh, again, we need to make them aware of the bias and we need to point out to the people who uh, do. Uh, um, or are accountable for the bias that uh, uh, that they need to be held accountable to. So it's been announced that SpaceX is going to be raising its prices and with that NASA is now going to have to be paying more for less cargo delivery to our International Space Station in 2020. Is Congress looking into this? Are there concerns about giving you know just one uh, you know 
provider of, of space technology um, such access to something that America relies on? You, you might argue that SpaceX has a monopoly. I don't quite see it that way. I think there's more competition. Um, but beside that, SpaceX is still providing provisions to the International Space Station. They are still uh, sending rockets up at less cost than NASA has in the past or than the Russians do. So they're still, you, wanna, you might say, uh, less than the alternatives. But we shouldn't let any company have a corner of the market. And there's enough interest, commercial interest in space these days that I think you will have competition. And I don't think any company is going to be allowed to sort of um, artificially increase uh, prices. Uh, beside that, a lot of the contracts, uh, many of the contracts that SpaceX and these other companies get are contracts from NASA. Uh, and it's a, an acknowledgement by NASA, maybe they can do it quicker, more efficiently at less cost than we do, or at least let's all help each other. We're all in this together. And so there's a sense of, um, um, there's a sense there of a little bit of rivalry, but also that we all benefit by reducing the cost. We all benefit by sending more rockets up. We all benefit by being able to, you know, get back to the moon or go to Mars. And we all benefit from space exploration. And there's a sense of synergy there where the, the sum is greater than the than the sum of the parts. And uh, so we hope to keep going that way in space. There's so much to do, so much to explore. Uh, we, we certainly cannot afford any and uh, missed deadlines and cost overruns. That's what really concerns me with the private companies is when they give us a deadline and they tell us what the cost is going to be of, say, the James Webb telescope, and all of a sudden the cost keeps going up, the deadlines keep getting missed. That's when we need to hel hold those companies accountable or don't give them future contracts. And because we always have that in our back pocket, uh, that's another countervailing factor that I think will keep prices down. So on the topic of Space Force, um, one of the criticisms uh, from the right is, why do we need a space force when we can't even build a wall? What's your response? Uh, I, I think that's nonsensical. <laughs> uh, we can build all kinds of structures, whether they mean along the border or wherever they're talking about. Uh, that hasn't been the problem. The problem has been either getting the money or getting the okay from Congress, which the Democrats consistently vote against. So they really can't complain, for instance, about not building structures when they don't vote to support it. Uh, and they're on the wrong side of the great majority of the American people by taking that view. Uh, but uh, when it comes to a space force, Democrats have a history uh, oftentimes of being anti-defense, anti-military, and we're seeing manifested again uh, with their opposition to the space force. Let's not just automatically reject any idea that comes from the president or from the military. Uh, let's investigate it. Uh, let's see where it goes. Let's see if it has practical application. Let's see if it works. But uh, the Democrats just automatically reject whether it's a space force, whether it's anything the president might propose, whether it's a new Supreme Court justice. Their first reaction is no, never. And it looks unthinking. It doesn't look rational. And I think the American people are going to react not well uh, to Democrats who keep saying no uh, and keep uh, denying us progress in this country. <laughs>